Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm really impressed by the number of people that came in such a short notice. I don't know if you realize that we hosted this event probably 10 days ago. It was not uh, because we're not well organized. It's because it's really a pressing issue uh, and we've been discussing uh, that we should do that rather sooner than organize too much and miss the momentum. So we decided just to post it and see uh, who, how many people would come and we are really, you can see that this topic is, is quite important indeed. Uh, my name is Fabio De Castro, I'm a, a researcher at SEDLA. SEDLA is just on the other side, some of you may not know, uh, we are Center of, uh, of uh, Latin American Studies here at the University of Amsterdam. We do research in Latin American social processes, we teach uh, courses, undergrad and graduate programs in Latin American studies, and uh, we also are very engaged uh, with uh, working together with the civil society as much as we can. As researchers, as you know, time is limited, but uh, thanks to uh, NALAX, that is our co-organizer, that uh, I'm happy to be also a member of NALAX, so I'm wearing two hats today here, Actually, three because I'm also the speaker. <laughs> it's like uh, I, I, I have the ball, so I have to play the game, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, the idea is that the Knowledge and Sedla has been organizing this kind of event called the Dialogues with Civil, with civil Society. The, the, this idea is that we felt that there is a niche that we could fill, that we need to bridge a bit more researchers, academic uh, discussions with practitioners, with uh, citizens interested in the topic, trying to get engaged uh, or, or getting some kind of uh, information, but participate in debates at the same level, and even more, because the dialogues, who, the main protagonists of the dialogues are usually civil society uh, representatives. So researchers, in fact, are invited just to be a discussant uh, but the, the, the main uh, topic is run first by civil society uh, representatives. Uh, this is the first time that uh, we decided to do this special, the, as you saw it's a special event we usually do at Sedla, just uh, in our building, because we realized that uh, the room that we have, about 40, 45 people, wouldn't be enough. And I'm, 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 I think we are right, because we have more people than, than 45 here, so I'm mean, glad that we, we decide to do here. Um, and, and the way we decide to do it is a little bit different than our format. Uh, we're going to start with the academic side, and so I will give a short presentation. And the reason we're doing that because we want to end, we are going to start with the academic, then we go to the NGO representative, and then we are going to end with the, an activist that will try later to make the connection with you to talk about possible solutions. So we come more from the context to the practice and then with the actions. So that's why we turned around, the researcher now starts uh, and ends with the activists this time. Uh, we have uh, until five, so our presentation will be about 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes, each one of us, and then we have plenty of time for discussion. And after five something, if when we finish, uh, we will have uh, uh, some time for drinks, and that will be another way also to engage and to discuss uh, over drink, which is always nice, right? <laughs> so it's Friday afternoon. So I think we thought that you would enjoy this, that part of the event as well. Okay, uh, so first I'm going to introduce, well, I introduce myself, I'm a researcher at SEDLA, I, my research is in environmental governance in, in Latin America. I'm originally from Brazil, uh, I've been doing research in the Brazilian Amazon for almost 20 years. Wow, yeah, <laughs> just realized something now. Uh, and I've been working now more recently in a project that is called Agents, that has to do with uh, local initiatives. To, to try to find some local transformations in terms of uh, land use and production of sustainable production. And I just came from field work uh, two months ago, totally, uh, be, totally no, but be depressed because uh, the project was written in one context 
and now it's being implemented in a very, very different context. Uh, I have to say that uh, the fire was exactly right after I came back. So we didn't have that discussion in field work. So for me, it's quite interesting now that I will go back later this year and to get some feedback, local feedback from that. But what I have to present to you, more than talking about just the fire, I thought it would be interesting to bring some provocative uh, reflections for, for today, okay? So, let's go, let's see. First, I, I organized my, my lecture, uh, or my short presentation in, in messages, because that would make, I think, a little bit uh, easier. I think I'm going to move this, because I feel tired, so I cannot move. Uh, uh, first, uh, first message that I want to bring is that we are talking about Amazon, uh, there's a tendency to think about Brazil, because we, especially because the, the international media was talking about the fire, mostly the visible aspect was happening in Brazil. But I want to call your attention that actually the Amazon is a much bigger region, and it brings a large area of South America, including several countries in South America. So when you talk about the Amazon, even when you talk about the fire, we, are, we have to remember that there are other countries involved. So I know there are many people here from Brazil uh, and are interested in Brazil, and the discussion has been around Brazil, but we need to remember that this is, goes beyond the Brazilian border, goes beyond national politics, and I want to bring this, uh, discuss this uh, more detail in another slide. So the second, this, uh, this slide here, uh, this picture is just to show how Bolivia, it was in the news, uh, but not as visible as Brazil uh, was uh, a few weeks, two, three weeks ago. But uh, Bolivia is going through the same dramatic uh, experience. The second message that I want to bring is that also deforestation, when we think about deforestation, we're talking about climate change, we have to remember that deforestation goes beyond the, this ecological aspect, the aspect of climate change. Uh, there are people living in this environment, so I have to, to remember these are territories. These are territories where people are living for the indigenous populations for about 12,000 years, the first occupations. And so far, archaeological uh, data shows that for at least 12,000 12, years, indigenous populations live in the region. We have, after the colonization, mixed population. So you have people living in the estuary. They are not indigenous, but they are traditional population. They have different life, uh, livelihood uh, uh, experiences. You go along the river, you see the riverine population. If you go a little bit more towards Acre, you have the rubber tappers. That was a the rubber boom period, also important aspects because it was an important period of globalization of the Amazon. We talk about globalization of the Amazon in the last 15, 50 years. I always tell my students there are three globalizations of the Amazon. The first is the first colonization period that people got into the, the Amazon and took basically uh, all the products that they could to bring to Europe. But the second one was with industrialization process and then the, the natural rubber that was extremely important, transformed major territories and transformed the, the geographies and the socio, social aspects of the region. And now we are moving to the third one that's been, let's see if it will survive this third cycle. Uh, we have also uh, Afro descendant communities. They are also reminding of, of, uh, of uh, our history of uh, slavery. That many thousands of communities that they are, they are Afro descendants living in that, this region with a different lifestyle. We have also the colonists, we have also small farmers. Some that were able to buy their, 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 uh, their title, some that they have, they're fighting to get a place there through this the Landless Workers Movement, a very important movement in Brazil, and proving that it's possible to produce uh, agriculture sustainably and in healthy food. Uh, so when, when you talk about this region, we're talking about this kind of diversity, not only biological diversity. And last but not least, the Amazon today is in a very urbanized space. You have more than 70% of the population living in urban areas. You have cities as big as Belém, or Manaus, that's here in the middle, more than a million people in this area, or hundreds of middle and small-sized uh, uh, cities and towns and villages 
that have more urban, have been urbanized more and more in the last time, last year. So when we talk about the region, we should also not remember, think about the rural population, but we have to think about this large population, urban population, that by the way, when we talk about political mobilization, they are extremely important. Now, the third message might be a little bit provocative, <coughs> but I would like to bring that for discussion. That I think also when you talk about the environmental injustice that we see in, 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 uh, in the Amazon, including Brazil, in other countries, and the fire included, uh, goes beyond the left and right government divide. I think uh, we have to remember that uh, uh, this, from the 70s, it's still military government, so we had this, this first frontier of the Amazon, logging, uh, oil, uh, cattle ranching, all over opening space in the Amazon. That was, let's say, before the, 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 the progressive governments in the Amazon. But at, during the progressive government, there was a huge boom of infrastructure, like dams. Uh, soy expansion happened just in the last 15, 20 years, and oil palm. That also in Brazil has happened, it's happening in other countries as well. So we do have a problem that goes beyond the national politics. It's still important, I'm going to go back to the national politics, but I think when we talk about the Amazon, we're talking about this process of commodification of the economy that's driven by the demands from uh, export, for export. Okay, this is, uh, oops, this is a map, uh, a chart that shows uh, biomass and, and construction, all the natural resources that has been uh, exported from Latin America, this is a broader, so it's not only the Amazon, and you see from the 2000s, there's a huge increase of extraction, expansion of these commodities, and to, because of demands coming from China, but also from here, by the way. So, uh, I... I think it's interesting to talk about left and right using this example of Bolivia in Brazil. Because Bolivia, we uh, have a case of a progressive government that's still in place for the third term. It's going to run for the first time uh, in a month or so. Uh, and it comes from indigenous background. And it has uh, used, uh, the established the, 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 the uh, the nature, uh, rights of nature in the constitution, and still is going through similar problems. Uh, the local population, the Jewish population, going through exactly the same problems as the Brazilian case is happening, that started with progressive and moved the right to the, have the turn to the right. So we have the president of Brazil who had no interest in what the fire actually had uh, not even uh, stepped to see what was going on. But then you have the case of Evo Morales going, flying over, and then taking this very little hose and showing a <laughs> sprinkle of some water to say that it's helping to extinguish the fire. But it is a different attitude. Not, the contest is very similar, and the problems are the same. But you have something in terms of the image of these two leaders that I think for us is important. I want to go back to that, how different sometimes, how much more difficult it is to fight this image than this. Because this is clearly against. When you don't have, you have a discourse that you are in favor, but you use and you follow the same system, then it's a bit more difficult to fight against. I think in a, in a way, my provocation here is that Bolsonaro for us might be actually good to make some changes. Because it's so obvious that's clearly against, you have the example of all the other leaders going against. To go against Evo Morales is a little bit more tricky, right? <coughs> now, the fact that, um, having said that, that the right and left uh, divide doesn't explain everything, it does explain some. And actually, this turn to the right made things a lot worse. And we can see that that uh, this is the forestation rate of the Amazon, it dropped tremendously exactly during the progressive government in Brazil. So institutions were in place, monitoring was in place, some kind of sanctions were there, everything was in place. There were some institutionalities, there were some mechanisms of protection. 
even though the government could be trying to expand uh, the commodities and so on, these institutions were at some point uh, uh, were working. Now, when we had the last, from 2016, from the, the, the institutional coup that after moved to the, to the, uh, the right-wing government, all these institutionalities start to be unmade. Okay, so you have some information that we heard, maybe some of you already probably heard, that the government has changed the data that you have collected for agrarian uh, data, so you don't know anymore so much about the, 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 the farmers, the, the family farmers, because these information are not relevant anymore. Uh, deforestation rate, well, I don't like the number, so I fire the person who produced the number. So this kind of attitudes, to, just to change Bad data, data that are not uh, uh, good for the government is out, and data that are good, we make it. So a uh, lot of fake news saying that NGOs had set a fire in the Amazon, those kind of things, and spread this information all over uh, the, uh, the, the social media. You have a strong narrative of races, of uh, discrimination, and against uh, the denial of global warming. So all those things about uh, uh, to, to trying to neutralize any kind of, of reaction from, from uh, mobilization, social mobilization. Institutional dismantling, I just list a few, but there's much more. There's a, there are a lot of things happening. I, uh, two days ago, I just talked to someone for a major NGO in Brazil, and he told me the reason actually the government tried to create this situation is because the, all, all the money that comes, for example, the, fund, the, the, the Amazon fund and all the international money, the idea is to deny this money because this money goes through to NGOs to develop their, pro their projects. So without this money, there's no project. And that's exactly what's happening with many NGOs. And finally, changing the, the, the demarcation of land and, tra and trying to privatize, reclassify protected areas and so on. So this unmaking of policies is creating this chaotic or lack of governance of the Amazon. So yes, the right turn did make things a lot worse. Uh, one last, no, I think the one before the last, uh, I think uh, I want to bring that uh, aspect because I just mentioned that the Amazon is not only a rural space, I think it's very important that we can think about solutions, not uh, only with the local rural population, but trying to engage the urban population in this fight, okay? And I think also have to go beyond these local struggles and the global struggles. The local struggles, people are dying, they are being killed every day because of their, their defense in their territories. But we have at the global level, like we have today, you know, and it's happening all over the world, this movement, the new movement of climate strikes coming from the young generation which is beautiful, it's wonderful, so it gives us a little bit of uh, you know, hope. But we have here some gap that we need to fill. Uh, some of this gap is being filled now by women's movement. Uh, we have the Marcha das Margaridas in Brazil that was a wonderful movement that brings all the women, the rural uh, uh, movements, but also the urban movements being involved. So the women are taking the lead in this struggle, but I think what uh, has a nice opportunity, this is the twist, I think, of this event of the fire, is the fire became, made the problem more visible to a large extent. Not only to the cities of the Amazonian cities that you could not breathe. People, I got, I'm in touch with people, they can barely breathe, breathe in, in, in their houses, but got all the way to the south, to the largest Latin American city, or the second largest Latin American city, city, Sao Paulo, was dark at three in the afternoon one day. Why? This is the smoke that comes all the way down to the south of Brazil. So that made people see the problem is closer to them as well. So I will go back to this, to how that can be maybe the fire. We can use the fire as actually an opportunity. One last message, this is something I've been seeing more and more in my research, I work with the local uh, communities, is that I think resistance, 
when you talk about resistance, we have to think that it's not only a political and economic uh, issue. It's a cultural issue. We have in, in Acre, for example, where you have the extractive reserves, the young generation loves cattle. They love to go to the cattle fairs. This is something that it's a very strong image. And the women love the guys who go with the cattle and all those kind of things. They are young. So they are moving to the cattle ranching activity, not only because it's economically interesting for them, but culturally, they are closer to something bigger, something more interesting, something more appealing. This is a very important aspect. We are very much involved and connect the political and economic aspects. We are not talk so much, talking so much about the cultural dimension, the value change, the social transformation, the cultural transformation happening in this region, the image of the modern, modernity, the city, and the, the, the money, and the consumption. So these are very important aspects that we have to bring in our narratives uh, of resistance. So, just to finalize, it's not a problem of the fire, it's a national, international driver. But I would say that we have to be uh, very aware that the fire is not a problem. The fire is a symptom. It is very important to look for the problem. And when you, for example, tries to give some money, 20 million euros, to help to put off the fire, I think that's a little bit too little, right? And I think money is not what they need to do. They need to take a stand and to maybe revise the Mercosur and, 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 and uh, 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 an EU agreement that's on the table that is talking about expansion of uh, commodities in Brazil. So we want much more than money. And there's this money, as I tell people, this is paracetamol for a cancer patient. It does nothing, okay? Uh, and the last thing that I find important is the fire, for us, could be a very important element of action. It's actually good, because the problem was happening, has been happening for a few years, many years. Now we have the fire, now we see. So good that happened. And of course, you understand what I mean. It's horrible, people cannot breathe, and, and it's, people are losing their houses, but now there's more chance for alliance and more chance for social and political mobilization. So that's it. Uh, you know, two projects. If you want to visit, we have some projects working there in the Amazon that has to do with new uh, different uh, approaches to, to natural resource. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to continue. Uh, we're going to ask you to hold your questions, please, and write down because we want all your participation. I'd like now to invite uh, Cinta, uh, the striker. Uh, Cinta is a cultural anthropologist working with human rights and environmental organizations from both ends. And she's been involved in international projects that are addressing deforestation of the Amazon, including Brazil, Bolivia, and Peru. Did I say correctly? Oh. Almost. <laughs> In Ecuador. All right. So, see, uh, see, yeah, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm happy to see so many faces today here. Uh, my name is Sima de Strijker, and thank you, Fabio, for the introduction. I work at Both Ends. Both Ends is a human rights and environmental justice organization. We are based in Amsterdam, actually kind of right around the corner. Um, so today, I will actually address the issues from an NGO or practitioner perspective. So I would like to give some examples of initiatives that um, exist in relation to the Amazon, as well as our position in all of this, together with our partners from all around the world. But also importantly, actually, I would like to discuss the homework that we need to do over here in the Netherlands and in the European Union 
on top of pointing our finger, for example, to, to Bolsonaro, right? Um, so, when we talk about the Amazon, the Amazon is, of course, the green lungs of our Earth. It's home to, for example, indigenous communities. But when I think about the Amazon, I also picture not only a massive green forest, uh, but also I picture activities of mining companies, uh, oil companies, uh, infrastructure projects, large-scale uh, palm oil plantations, soy plantations, and so on, all causing, actually, uh, the large-scale uh, deforestation in the Amazon, right? And um, actually, of which I also want to mention, but Fabio already did so, is that the fires uh, that are currently going on are not um, per se the actual cause, we see it more as a symptom, right? Um, now, I would say, on a macro perspective, or from a macro view, the clearance of land through fires is often facilitated through, for example, unsustainable trade and investment policies, export credit agencies, uh, international um, financial institutions and money flows, to just name a few. And um, actually, these are the topics that Boten, so the organization I'm working for, has actually a wide range of ex expertise on. And as such, we have been working in the Amazon region for about 25 years. Um, to just give one concrete example, um, Botens in the past year uh, was like the secretariat for the Dutch Soy Coalition. And in this uh, coalition, we actually um, have been monitoring together with others, like the export of soy from Brazil, Paraguay and Argentina to the Netherlands, uh, as well as we have been like monitoring uh, the amount of certified soy. Um, in case you have more interest to read about this, I also brought some booklets and flyers that you can, you can check later. Um, but where I want to go to is that our expertise, our work in the Amazon in the past years eventually also led to the fact that Botans became part of the All Eyes on the Amazon program. And here you can see like a, a fact sheet of this program. Um, which was carried out since 2016. Um, it's in the lead by Heroes and Greenpeace. And All Eyes on the Amazon is actually an international coalition of 31 uh, partners from the Netherlands, from the United States, and from Peru, Brazil, and Ecuador. Um, so addressing uh, the deforestation and its consequences in these three Amazon countries, but eventually also aiming to halt deforestation on a local level and also on a structural level. Now, how this initiative looks like, uh, I would like to discuss um, in a moment, uh, actually by referring to the case of, of Ecuador. Uh, why Ecuador? Well, I've been there two weeks ago. Uh, it was our annual meeting with all of our international partners. And we also went to the Ecuadorian Amazon. And of course, um, also as Fabio already rightfully mentioned, when we talk about the fires, we often think about uh, Brazil and Bolivia in the first place. But um, before I make an, an argument, I would like to show a small, uh, a very short video. I would just like to ask, um, who doesn't understand Spanish? Ah, awesome. Oh, some people. Okay, I'll try to make it small. Queremos nuestra selva para nuestra vida, para nuestra gente, para nuestra familia. Y aquí estamos y estaremos siempre de pie en lucha por nuestra madre tierra. Quito two weeks ago, this was a protest, protest march organized by local indigenous groups um, from, from Ecuador. And in this video, what you see is like they are giving a speech actually uh, also in solidarity with their uh, Brazilian uh, brothers and sisters, we call them, from Brazil, from Bolivia. Um, because first and foremost, it's a united struggle, right? We're talking about structural